Welcome. In our last lecture, we surveyed the histories of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. Now, just as these major trading states arose in West Africa, along the southern shore of a sea of sand, so in East Africa, there emerged a distinctive commercial culture on the shore of a real sea, the Indian Ocean. A remarkable document from the first century AD, written in Greek in the Roman, uh, Roman Egyptian city of Alexandria, called the Periplus of the Erythraean Sea, uh, which was the name for the, the Indian Ocean, is essentially a guide to the Indian Ocean for Mediterranean and Red Sea uh, trading ships and their, their captains. It shows quite clearly that by that point, some 2,000 years ago, that what the Greeks called Azania, that is the East African coast, was already connected commercially with areas to the north. Now, forgive me a, a slight digression at the start on the, the word Azania. We've noted when we looked at Ghana, for instance, and we'll note again in the, in the next lecture on, on Great Zimbabwe, that some of these fabled names from the, the African past are brought forward and, in essence, appropriated as a, uh, a sort of resource for, for African pride, if you like, when colonies become uh, independent. Gold Coast takes the name from the old uh, West African Empire of Ghana. Uh, modern Zimbabwe takes its name from, from Great Zimbabwe, which we look at in the next lecture. Now, what does this have to do with Azania? In the 1970s, as the apartheid system in South Africa was very much in the saddle, there were, of course, a number of opposition uh, movements to it, some inside and some uh, still legal and some exiled uh, and, of course, outlawed. Some of the opponents of the apartheid regime. And in this case, they were opponents who differed from, and in fact were split away from, opposed the African National Congress, uh, which was illegal and in exile. And of course, the African National Congress is the, the party of, of Nelson Mandela. But these opponents of apartheid who styled themselves to be more radical than the African National Congress uh, at a certain point, took up the name Azania and uh, forecast this, in a sense, uh, began to use it to refer to the country officially known as the Republic of, of South Africa. In other words, the notion that the sort of Ghana and Zimbabwe uh, precedent would be, would be followed again here. So you get movements like the Azanian People's Organization coming into to some prominence uh, in the 1970s, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, as I just noted, um, Zaini is a little bit different case here. This is a term, after all, coined by, uh, by outsiders, by Greeks. It's one that they came up with for, for the East African coasts. And of course, the East African coast is, is not exactly South Africa, although that didn't matter in the case of, of, of ancient and uh, modern uh, Ghana. Well. The, the Greek origins of this uh, were not lost on the ANC, and after Mandela was released and South Africa, of course, went through its, its sea change and, and emerged as the, uh, the country it is today with the African National Congress very much the ruling party, you'll notice that the name has not been changed uh, to uh, Azania. Okay, so much for my digression. A series of small settlements along what the Greeks called Azania, along the coast, provided ivory, tortoise shell, coconut oil, in return for ironware, cotton cloth, wheat, wine. The southernmost of these settlements mentioned in the Periplus, this guide to the Indian Ocean, was called Rapta, 
The exact location of Rapta remains a little bit unclear. Um, some suggest that it was the island of Pimba in the, off the shore of the northern part of, of today's Tanzania. Uh, others that uh, located closer to, to modern day uh, Dar es Salaam. But it gives an idea of how far south on that coast the familiarity uh, reflected in that document went. The population here, described as tall and dark skinned, consisted of early Iron Age mixed farmers, but because of their coastal location, of course, skilled as well in taking advantage and, and fishing the coves and island waters of the, of the coast. By about the 5th century AD at the latest, they were almost certainly speaking Bantu languages. That is, languages part of that vast family of four or five hundred languages stretching from Central and East Africa all the way down to South Africa. In the later centuries of the first millennium AD, trade across the greater Indian Ocean began to take off, if you will, and the great groundwork was laid for a genuinely urban, commercial, East African culture. Sailors in improved ships, and in this case, the, the key was, was a ship out of Arabia, the Dow, Latin sail, uh, skillfully exploited the Indian Ocean monsoon winds, which blow essentially in one direction during half the year and in the other, the, the other half. They blow essentially from the coast, the East African coast, towards the Arabian Sea and, and therefore towards uh, uh, Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, Persia, and India from uh, April to October. And then uh, they blow from those, those areas towards the, the East African coast from about November to, to March. Now, contact was especially extensive then with the Muslim societies of the Arab and Persian worlds. They had their own term, as the Greeks had, for East Africa, which was the, the land of Zanj. Sometimes you'll see that spelled uh, Zinj or Z-E-N-J. And this comes from a, a word of Persian origin uh, for black and obviously a reference to the, the inhabitants of this East African coast. By this time, it is likely that some Arab Muslims settled in towns along the coast, indeed may have founded some of those, and some others, descendants of the indigenous population, may already have adopted uh, Islam. Ivory from African elephants was by far the most important export at this time. Uh, the African elephant is considerably larger than his uh, Asian cousin, and the tusks are, are, are larger. It's also considered superior in quality and is, is softer and more, more carvable. Uh, the wider diameter of the tusk was, was uh, useful for the making of um, bracelets, which were a very popular item uh, made of ivory in India. The, the greatest demand may have come from China, where the, the carrying chairs, the sort of sedan chairs of the, of the nobility, the preferred material for the construction of those, uh, was also uh, African ivory. But this certainly was not the, the, only, um, the only thing coming out of East Africa. Ambergris, which is um, a fossilized resin, but gives off a very pleasant scent. In essence, it's, a, it's a, an early version of, uh, of perfume, if you like. Mangrove poles, which were uh, valued for their, for their straightness. And a small quantity of gold at this point followed uh, in importance. Now, we briefly mentioned the presence of, of slaves in our survey of the West African Savannah Kingdoms last, last time. And again, it will not be prominent here, but um, it, it's a foreshadowing of, of subjects to come. Some African slaves drawn from the coast's hinterland were also exported, especially to the Basra region uh, of, the, of today's uh, Iraq, uh, southern, southernmost Iraq, I suppose you'd say. And in fact, there in 868 AD, a major slave rebellion uh, broke out, which was uh, titled by historians of, of that area, the, the so-called Zanj 
uh, revolt. Now, as I did last time, I, I want to go to some contemporary sources to, to give us a little bit of a feel of the unfolding of, of the human experience in some of these places along uh, the, the East African coast. And the earliest of these uh, is a document which was written in 916 uh, AD by, um, uh, again, an Arabic scholar and traveler named al-Masudi. He traveled down the East African coast uh, on Adal, which uh, originally came from his home in Oman at the southern tip, the southeastern uh, tip of the Arabian Peninsula. And here's his description of Zanj just at the close of the first millennium AD. The land of Zanj produces wild leopard skins. The people wear them as clothes or export them to Muslim countries. They are the largest leopard skins and most beautiful for making saddles. They also export tortoise shell for making combs for which ivory is likewise used. The Zanj have an elegant language and men who preach in it. One of their holy men will often gather a crowd and exhort his hearers to please God in their lives and to be obedient to him. He explains the punishments that follow upon disobedience and reminds them of their ancestors and kings of old. These people have no religious law. Their kings rule by custom and by political expediency. The Zanjit bananas, which are as common among them as they are in India, but their staple food is millet. They also eat honey and meat. They have many islands where the coconut grows. Its nuts are used as fruit by all the Zanj peoples. One of these islands, which is one or two days sail from the coast, has a Muslim population and a royal family. This is the island of Kanbalu, and this again, not exactly located. This may indeed be the island of, of Pemba. Now, from Al Masudi's description, it seems to me we can draw certain kinds of, uh, of, of uh, impressions. He not only gives us some idea of everyday life in terms of, of food and diet, the commercial stuff, the tortoise shells and, and ivory, etc., etc., leopard skins, he adds to the uh, to the, to the list, um, but there are also interesting references to culture and, and religion here. When he's speaking of the elegant language and the men who preach it, uh, et cetera, et cetera, he's speaking really of, of one of our localized indigenous religions, and the, the, the clue to that is his mild put-down at the end of uh, one of the paragraphs I read where he says, these people have no religious law. Uh, He's obviously speaking about a non-Muslim uh, orator here in the sense that uh, there is the lack of the Sharia, the, the, the Muslim law, which of course would be the case uh, were he um, Muslim. And yet the very last lines I, I mentioned there show that when he mentions another island, a different island, where there's a Muslim population and royal, royal family. And in fact, the predominantly at this stage still non-Muslim uh, character of the area is indicated in the in the first sentence where he said that um, the the leopard skins are exported to Muslim countries, implying certainly that this is not yet one of those. Okay, between about 1000 and 1500 A.D., early in the the second millennium. The East African coast entered its own version of a, of a golden age. The Swahili world had arrived. Now, in a variation on our theme of state building, which has run through the last several lectures, eventually about 40 independent, compact city-states came to dot the coastal map. And they stretched from today's Somalia, Mogadishu, now putatively, the, the capital of, of that state, if indeed the Somalia state uh, is operable, probably the northernmost of the Swahili city-states, and Safala, uh, the, the southernmost. So about 40 altogether, quite independent, considering themselves uh, rivals, but rarely um, carrying that to the extent of, uh, of armed conflict. They're primarily commercial rivals and, and quite jealous of their share of um, particular trade linked to Arabia, Persia, India, 
eventually China, the Indian Ocean trade. Now, city-state, of course, refers to a situation where the urban center, the city, uh, is coterminous with the, the country itself, if you like, or the state itself. There are, are in other words, it's not a capital in the center of a, of a more extensive uh, territory. It's self-contained. And we have examples of that still in, in the modern world. Probably Singapore would, would qualify. Uh, Hong Kong might have, have qualified before its reabsorption into um, uh, mainland China. Uh, perhaps even the, the Vatican. Swahili city-states, then, a, a variation on the, the theme of, of state creation and state building. Now, the city's elites here were, were quite cosmopolitan. There were uh, frequent shipments and therefore a considerable availability of goods from Arabia, Persia, India, China. Uh, they were common. They co constructed elegant homes out of coral stone and mangrove. Now, coral is, is an interesting building material. It is, obviously comes from the, the sea and it can be readily worked, that is, uh, cut and, and shaped uh, into blocks while submerged underwater. Once exposed to the air, on the other hand, uh, it takes on a, a permanent hardness which makes it uh, possible to, to construct buildings and, and homes uh, with it. As in West Africa, the, the literal importance of, of gold increased. In this case, the Swahili, especially the southern towns, like Kilwa, prospered from gold mined far in the interior on the Zimbabwean plateau. And we take up the Zimbabwean story uh, as the centerpiece of our, our next lecture. Now, you might assume that gold would be the, the element uh, used in the uh, many thousands uh, of, of coins that were, in fact, minted uh, at a couple of centers. There were certainly uh, mints at Kilwa, Zanzibar, and probably Mogadishu. That appears not to have been the case. The gold was, uh, was for export. The local coins tended to be made uh, out of copper. Uh, although in 1985, uh, a team of archaeologists unearthed a, a cache of um, over 2,000 uh, coins minted locally uh, made of, of silver. Well, let's try to parse this world a little bit uh, in terms of, of disentangling, if you will, the, the indigenous African and the, the external uh, influences. My take on this would be essentially that the Swahili world, the Swahili culture was basically uh, African, but that there certainly was an important overlay, a substantial overlay coming across the Indian Ocean down that coast from Arabia and Persia, from parts of um, the, the, the world of Southwest Asia. Now, we can see this perhaps best uh, by looking uh, as language, which so often gives us clues to, to historical uh, realities. The language here is Ki Swahili. Now, I emphasize the, the, the prefix there of Ki, K-I uh, Swahili. Bantu words, uh, one of the characteristics of Bantu uh, vocabulary of, the, of those languages is that the root meaning of words lies at the end of the word rather than at the beginning. So, whereas in the Indo-European, Germanic languages, Romance languages, and so forth that we are more familiar with, the root of the word is at the beginning, and you change or specify, refine the meaning of the word by changing the, the end of it, to make it plural, or, or to put it in past tense, or what have you. In Bantu languages, it's exactly the reverse. Uh, you change the, the prefix. Now, what does that have to do with Ki Swahili? Ki is the prefix, of course, and in this case, it, it simply refers to the language of uh, the Swahili. And you find that prefix of ki, ki or chi or uh, isi as the prefix in front of many Bantu ethnic names. So, Chitonga, the language of the Tonga. But you can change that prefix and make it Butonga uh, to be the country of the Tonga or what have you. Isizulu, the language of the 
of the Zulu. So Ki Swahili, the, the prefix there itself, is, is a giveaway that this is a quite thoroughly Bantu language. And if you put a page of Swahili side by side with a page of Isi Zulu or Chitanga, you can see this uh, similarity uh, quite clearly. Now, on the other hand, <laughs> the root meaning there of Ki Swahili, if you recall our, our explanation of the root of the West African term Sahel, that it comes from the Arabic similar term Sahel or Sahil for coast or shore, it's essentially Swahili is, is drawn as a, as a bit of a corruption of the same word. So it's an Arabic word, it's based on the Arabic word for coast, just as Sahel is in, in West Africa. So yes, Bantu language, that's shown by the prefix, but the root itself is a borrowed word from, from Arabic. And I, again, that's an indicator of this cultural overlay in, in the language of the coast. We, we find a large number of vocabulary terms that are imported from, uh, from languages like Arabic onto a Bantu and therefore African indigenous uh, base. Now, influence from places like Arabia and Persia certainly increased in certain periods, uh, especially between 1050 and 1200, approximately between those dates, there was a further immigration from the Persian Gulf and especially from Oman at the southern tip of, of Arabia. These were usually well-connected traders and these newcomers and their descendants uh, generally wound up as, as part of the, of the local elite. They often intermarried with uh, indigenous populations and indeed a term like Arab slash Swahili uh, begins to become, to become relevant and, and even useful in our lecture 19, we'll actually look at a very famous uh, Arab Swahili figure. The, his popular name was Tipu Tip. Uh, his original base was Zanzibar off the coast, but he in fact in, established an inland uh, kingdom uh, based around ivory and in his case, most definitely in slaves in the 19th century. And we'll, we'll look at him uh, in our, our lecture uh, 19, Arab slash Swahili. Now, as we might expect, the religious impact was perhaps the greatest uh, part of the, the cultural package coming from, uh, from Arabia. And indeed, this becomes a quite Islamic part of Africa. I said last time, and I'll repeat it, that this coastal area, along with the West African savanna regions, historically probably the most thoroughly Islamized portions of the entire uh, African continent. Now, again, I'd like to go to the primary sources for, for a moment and give uh, two quick descriptions of um, the so-called uh, Queen of the South. Uh, that is the, uh, probably the, the most elaborate uh, city of the entire Swahili world, and that is, is Kilwa. One of them comes from our old friend uh, Ibn Battuta, who we we read a description of last time from 1352 and his, his travel from his original base in, uh, in Morocco, but he was everywhere. Now he turns up uh, even earlier, 20 years earlier than that, he's actually um, uh, observing uh, Kilwa in, in 1331. You'll notice that uh, at this point, Ibn Battuta is referring really to the northern portions of the coast of Swahili, and he's still using um, the, the older term Zanj to refer to the southern coast, so Ibn Battuta in 1331. Then I set off by sea from the town of Mogadishu for the land of the Swahili and the town of Kilwa, which is in the land of the Zanj. The people of Kilwa follow the Shafi'i rite. They are devout, chaste, and virtuous. Their mosques are very strongly constructed of wood. Beside the door of each mosque are one or two wells, one or two cubits deep. We spent a night on the island of Mombasa, and Mombasa today is the, the principal uh, port city of, uh, of, of Kenya, and then set sail for Kilwa, the principal town on the coast, the greater part of whose inhabitants are Zanj, of very black complexion. Kilwa is one of the most beautiful and well-constructed towns in the world. The whole of it is elegantly built. 
The people are engaged in a holy war, for their country lies beside that of the pagan Zanj. Now, uh, in this case, we, we see a, a considerable, uh, considerably greater impact of Islam, the, the reference to devout and, and so forth, the reference to the mosques and so forth, and maybe most of all in the, in the notion of jihad or holy war uh, in, in Ibn Battuta's observation in 1331, uh, apparently at that time currently going on against the so-called pagan inhabitants of, of the mainland. One more from about two centuries uh, later, which I'm actually going to turn to briefly twice, but from a very different uh, uh, direction uh, of, of source, of visitor. This one is from Duarte Barbosa, uh, who was Portuguese, and his observations come from the, the early 1500s. Going along the coast from this town of Mozambique, there is an island hard by the mainland which is called Kilwa, which is a Moorish town with many fair houses of stone and mortar, with many windows after our fashion, very well arranged in streets with many flat roofs. The doors are of wood well carved with excellent joinery. Around it are streams and orchards and fruit gardens with many channels of sweet water. It has a Moorish king over it. From this place they trade with Sofala, whence they bring back gold. Now, Sofala lies uh, a considerable length south of Kilwa and in general was not reachable uh, in a single season through the monsoon winds. So in the, gold, in the case of gold, which came from the Zimbabwean plateau first to Sofala, it had to move north to Kilwa, uh, whence it eventually wound up in the other parts of the Indian Ocean. Uh, literal. Barbosa continued, Of the Moors there are some fair and some black. They are finely clad in many rich garments of gold and silk and cotton, and the women as well, also with much gold and silver and chain and bracelets which they wear on their legs and arms and many jeweled earrings uh, in their, their ears. Well, I mentioned that Barbosa's observations uh, come from uh, the early part of the 1500s. Around the, the year 1500, we reach an interesting and critical juncture, not just in East Africa, but in, in the world as a whole. Uh, think of the date of, of Columbus's voyage as perhaps uh, the benchmark uh, in that case, and this is a, a turning point in world and African history that I will take up uh, in detail in, in lectures 13 uh, forward. It's interesting though to contemplate sometimes in history what might have happened. Uh, it's conceivable that China, which had already sponsored at least one recorded direct voyage to East Africa, could have expanded its influence there. Instead, China's court intrigues um, led to a conclusion to turn inward. Portugal, on the other hand, sponsored an epoch-making circumnavigation of the African continent in 1498, six years after Columbus's uh, voyage across the Atlantic. The European incursion had begun. And just seven years later, in 1505, a, uh, a fleet of 11 well-armed ships, Portuguese ships under the command of Francisco de Almeida, sailed again around the Cape of Good Hope and into the Indian Ocean and approached the so-called Queen of the South, the Swahili town of, of Kilwa. I again will go to the primary and eyewitness document, in this case from, the, uh, from an, a, a German uh, fellow traveler, I guess you'd say, uh, with, uh, on board of, of one of Dalmeida's uh, ships. From our ships, the fine houses, terraces, and minarets with the palms and trees in the orchards made the city, and this is Kilwa, look so beautiful that our men were eager to land and overcome the pride of this barbarian, it's a reference to the, the local sultan, who spent all that night in bringing into the island archers from the mainland, apparently a rather hysteric attempt to upgrade the military capability to uh, resist the Portuguese. Um, in the aftermath of the, the landing and uh, a Portuguese uh, victory. Uh, 
Then the vicar general and some of the Franciscan fathers came ashore carrying two crosses in procession and singing the Te Deum. They went to the palace, and there the cross was put down, and the grand captain, that is Dalmeda, prayed. Then everyone started to plunder the town of all its merchandise and provisions. Duarte was, uh, Duarte Barbosa was not present uh, at that sacking, but he later wrote about it, uh, and, and he put it this way, This town was taken by force from its king, by the Portuguese, as, moved by arrogance, he refused to obey the king, our lord. They took many prisoners, and the king fled from the island, and his highness ordered that a fort be built there and kept under his rule uh, and, and governance. Now, I close the last lecture by, by mentioning the Moroccan invasion of, of the old West African state of Songhai in 1591 and the introduction of um, some of the first firearms in, in, in West Africa. Again, these incidents, the one I've just described and, and the, the one in the last lecture, of course, occurring in the 16th century, uh, that is about 500 years ago, uh, perhaps do indeed uh, sound uh, an ominous note for... Uh, old independent Africa's future. Thank you.